Here we are in the Christmas season. Thank you, Matt. We will be in Matthew chapter 1 this morning, beginning in verse 18, seeing as we are indeed in the Christmas season. Um, I was recalling, as I was putting this sermon together, back in late 1988, after having served for several years on the uh, staff at my college uh, alma mater, I really felt that God was moving in my heart to move me into pastoral ministry. And so I shared that either at the end of the year, right at the beginning of 89, with my boss, who said that he would um, the executive vice president of, of the college. He said he would keep me in prayer and, and tell me of any opportunities that might come to his attention. <clears throat> and so the spring semester went on as usual, and uh, I was still praying, still keeping my, uh, my ears to the, to the track, so to speak, when, um, uh, to much to our surprise, I found out that uh, the trustees had met uh, during that graduation time, which they normally do, and they determined that it was in the school's best interest to begin looking for somebody to replace me, knowing that I was talking about going out into the pastorate. And uh, to our shock, um, I was let go. <laughs> it was like, wow. What? Didn't see that coming. And needless to say, um, we were hurt. We were confused. We were disappointed. We were, of course, fearful because what's next? Uh, there, weren't, there weren't any real open doors or anything like that. And our plans had gotten derailed. Life had radically changed at that point. I wonder how many today with an uplifted hand would say, I have had my plans get derailed and my life radically changed. Cool. All right. Then uh, those of you who, have, who are not able to raise your hand, you're in luck. <clears throat> yeah, buckle up, right? And for those of us who have had events in our lives that have radically changed life and, and derailed plans, um, I want to encourage you this morning because that may not be the only time that happens, all right? And perhaps today we'll help put some things into perspective. I wonder for those of us who raised our hands, how often we, ha we, we think or have thought, God is intervening. God is intervening. He's making a change here. And, um, and it's God who derailed my plans. Now, not, not blaming God, all right, but recognizing the sovereignty of God and the hand of God in everything, um, I think makes life a little bit easier. I want you to understand as we look at Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, that the first Christmas derailed plans for a lot of people, radically changed life for a lot of people. Before we read the text, please understand, as the angels appeared to the shepherds, the shepherds were not quite expecting that, were they? They had been out there night after night tending the sheep, and many believe that these were the sheep that would be taken to the temple for the sacrifices. So these shepherds had a very special job. And, uh, and it's only, in my mind, appropriate that these are the shepherds the angels would, would uh, appear to and God would proclaim uh, uh, the coming uh, sacrifice for the world, right? The Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Uh, but can you imagine as you start your night shift, like every other night shift, and all of a sudden, right? Whoa! 
<laughs> okay? And, and, and it says, and they were sore afraid. And I, I like that word in the King James because they were probably so afraid that they were sore. <laughs> they were, <laughs> all right? And, and then, of course, they get the good news. The Magi, the wise men, who I believe uh, in Babylon had the writings of the prophets, of Daniel in particular, and were watching for this supernatural star to declare to them and to the world that the Savior was born, that it, there was a new king of the Jews. And when they saw it, they said, okay, guys, let's saddle up. Now, I want you to understand, they didn't, I, I, they didn't jump into their cars and take off. They had an 800-mile trek by camel, donkey, you name it, through some harsh land. And they kissed the wives and kids goodbye and said, see you when we see you. But they were looking for the king. And God radically changed life for them. How about Herod? We read about Herod when, when the wise men got to Jerusalem. They said, hey, we've, where's, this, where's the king of the Jews that was born? We saw his star. Herod's title was king of the Jews. And he's like, whoa, this is not good. I don't, I don't like this at all. He inquired of the religious leaders where uh, this Messiah was supposed to be born. They said, well, in Bethlehem. And so Herod, once he found out that the wise men were gone and they, they had actually betrayed him, uh, he wanted them to come back and, and tell him where the baby was. But God warned them in a dream, and they, they went out another way. But when he found out, he sent soldiers to Bethlehem and had all the baby boys who were two years old and under put to death. Now, I'll just throw this out to you, okay? I've got a lot of stuff going on up here. It's a circus, all right? <laughs> Our traditional manger scenes with the wise men showing up at, at, at the, uh, you know, at the, uh, the crash uh, or the cave with, with the baby in the manger. No, it, he was probably close to two years old or so because of that, right? Why did Herod have the boys in Bethlehem two years old and younger put to death? He was probably, and, and when you read the text, it says, it says when the wise man came, they found the young child in, in the house, okay? It's important to read your Bible, all right? It, 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 we can't get our theology from Christmas cards. Although it's fun, it's nice, I get it, I get it. And we can still use it for God's glory. So anyway, Herod's life was turned upside down. Jerusalem was in an uproar when the Magi came and said, we're looking for the king of the Jews. They were like, whoa, everything, everything radically changed for them. Uh, Bethlehem afterwards, uh, that was a radical change, not for the better. And then, of course, Mary and Joseph, right? Mary and Joseph. Never, never in anybody's wildest imagination would they have dreamed this is how life was going to start for us. And here it is in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, 
did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Now I want to throw something in here. By the way, this, this is free. Free, please, okay? Anytime I read this passage, I want you to understand that there are those who have uh, an idea, a misconception, a misinterpretation perhaps, that um, Mary, after she gave birth to Jesus, uh, remained a virgin. Well, we find right here that's not the case. Okay? We find that it, it says that before they came together, right? It says of Joseph and Mary. And then in verse 25, he did not know her in the biblical sense, right? Conjugally, he did not know her until after the birth of their firstborn son. Okay? And then it only stands to reason because there are those who want to hold on to that particular doctrine of uh, Mary's perpetual virginity that uh, because of that Jesus never had brothers and sisters and those who later in the gospels are uh, are referred to as his brothers and sisters they want to say that that's a more general term and these were cousins and so on and so forth it just stands to reason for me as I look at the the, the extent of the Word of God, that if Mary found favor with God and God used her to bring Messiah into the world, the Savior into the world, and she and Joseph said, your will be done, God, We're, we'll do what you say, that he would have blessed them afterwards with children of their own, especially in a culture that saw childbearing as a blessing from God just stands to reason with me and so i just want to throw that out to you food for thought i want you to understand that god uses everything for his purpose and his plan which is to reveal his glory everything everything now he doesn't cause everything to happen but he can take that which is bad and all things do work together for good to those who love God. God will take even the, the evil and the bad and he will turn it into something that, that produces his purpose, his plan for his glory, to reveal his glory. And in the end, that's where it's all headed. But he will do it in the here and now in your life. Proverbs 19.21 says this, You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Make all the plans you want, but keep in mind that it's God's purpose that's going to prevail. That's why I believe we should be, when we make our plans, be prayerful, trusting God, not our own wisdom, and our own understanding is Proverbs 3. I'm sure you read that today, the third proverb on December 3rd. Uh, Trusting the Lord with all your heart, not leaning to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledging Him, and He will direct your path. And that's why we make our plans, as Jesus taught us to pray, Your will be done, not mine. Okay? Now, I started off with a story that, you know as still relatively young Christians, our world was rocked. But let me tell you very quickly how that worked out. We were members of the church here, and this church had started a church in East Boston about a year or so before I was let go at the college, almost a year and a half. Unbeknownst to me, the founding pastor here, as he, I, I knew he was, he was actually doing both churches. He would drive down there, preach a service, come back here, preach the service, and, and he got tired. <laughs> and he was praying for somebody to take over the church in East Boston. I went to him one day, because I would go down there to East Boston 
on Mondays, we would hand out literature, invite people to church, and every time I go down there, the burden for East Boston got heavier and heavier and heavier. And I finally came to him and I said, look, I'm not trying to inf- interject or infuse myself in anything that perhaps is not my own business, I said, but I'm really burdened for East Boston, and I think God might want me to be going down there. He said, well, let's pray about it. And after a couple of weeks, he said, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't. And so, there we went, East Boston, my first pastorate. We were, we were there at that church for 13 years before coming here. Did God know what he was doing? We, right? Did, did he do it the way we would have liked? No. And that's usually the case. So, let me say to you this. If the course of your life has changed radically by plans that have been derailed, then I believe God is trying to do one or more of three things in your life. The first one is this. He's trying to get your attention. He's trying to turn your attention to Him. In Psalm 81 Verses 8 through 13, the psalmist talks about, through the psalmist, God says, Listen to me, O my people, but no, my people wouldn't listen. They didn't want me around. So I let them follow their own stubborn desires, living according to their own ideas. Oh, that my people would listen to me. And time and again, as you read your Bible and you look at the, 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 uh, um, <clears throat> the, the historical, perspective and and the history of israel and god's people and even through the new testament you understand that god does things and sometimes they're severe he did some severe things with israel and by the way he's not done one day israel will recognize their messiah but in their hard-heartedness, they have not and will not. And God continues to send things upon them and to them. And by the way, He'll do that for you as well if you don't want to listen to Him. Did you notice He said here, my people wouldn't listen to me and because they didn't want me around. We have a lot of people who say, well, I believe in God. But a lot of people believe in God just enough and they want just enough of God that he's not a nuisance in their life right but you see God wants to be Lord and here's the cool thing when God is Lord in your life life is so much better now I don't want to I I should have (laughs) I should have put a picture up here I just thought of it had a picture come my way several several weeks ago a picture that could not describe us any better and as the bible describes us as sheep right and here's a picture an actual picture of three or four sheep wide open space and there's there are two posts and a gate out in the middle of nowhere and those sheep are standing behind the gate. <laughs> One of them actually peeking around a post. And it's like, this picture couldn't typify us more when it comes to our understanding and when it comes to really a lot of the things we do. Without God, we are lost. God wants you to turn your attention to Him. Some of us consider ourselves too busy. Some are too comfortable. Some are too distracted. Some are too disinterested. And some are too dismissive. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but He shouts to us in our pains. And a lot of times when things go awry, when our plans are derailed, people's first thought is, What did I do to deserve this? You've never said that, I'm sure. 
Why is God doing this to me? He's not doing it to you. He's doing it for you. He's calling, saying, here I am. And, and He's there. He's always there. I ask you this morning, what is it that God's trying to get your attention about today? Think about this. It might be your eternal soul. Your salvation. Look at Here's the deal. From the Bible. All have sinned and come short of God's glorious standard. There is none righteous, no, not one. All of our righteous works are as filthy rags before God because of our sin. We are lost. Humans are born into this world with a sin nature. There's a natural rebellion against the things of God. But, the, but God loved the whole world so much that He gave His Son that whoever puts their faith in Him will not perish. That's an eternal term, by the way. Will not perish eternally, but have everlasting life. But we have to make that decision. We have to decide, do I want Jesus in my life? The invitation is there. The door is open. Will we say, yes, Lord. Jesus, come into my life and be my Savior. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 12. He said, Don't be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But fear him who, after he has killed, has the power to cast into hell. He's the one you have to fear. Jesus said there's a heaven, there's a hell. The Word of God says very plainly, you can't earn heaven by your good works. We have already earned an eternal separation from God because of our sin. Listen, here's the deal. Let me just share this with you. God is so holy, so holy, that one bad thought is an affront to Him. And He cannot allow sin into His holy presence. If God allowed a sinner into heaven, it would ruin heaven. But God wants you there. He loves you that much. That's why Jesus died on the cross and took what you deserve upon Himself. So that you wouldn't have to. But, but, you have to turn to Him by faith. And so I wonder if Maybe you're going through something today, whether you're here, whether you're watching at home, and God's trying to get your attention because He wants, you, he wants to save your eternal soul. And you need to turn to Him today. You need to receive Jesus Christ into your life today as your personal Savior. Maybe God's trying to get your attention about sin in your life. Now here's the deal. Born-again people are still sinners. They're just saved. Saved sinners. And Paul even talked about the spirit warring against the flesh, this war that goes on in my body and in my mind. I want to do the things God says I should do, and yet I find that those are the things I don't do. This is Paul. And if Paul struggled that way, I would dare not put myself <laughs> on the level of the Apostle Paul. And God wants us, he, he wants to work in our lives to purge sin from our lives. But sometimes, 
because the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and by the way the, by that jesus is meaning the flesh is weak that it it flees to temptation it's strong against the spirit but it's weak when it comes to temptation and sin so maybe there's something in your life that you know you know you've been making excuses but you know you haven't been reading portions of scripture because it speaks to that the spirit of god is speaking to you every time jesus said this in matthew 15 the words you speak come from the heart and your thoughts and that's what's what defiles you from the heart come evil thoughts murder adultery all sexual immorality theft lying and slander and that's what defiles you in other words we're defiled by what's already in our hearts and so we need to turn our hearts over to the lord to the lord the apostle paul wrote in romans chapter 2 don't you see how wonderfully kind tolerant and patient god is with you aren't you glad about that i am glad that the thumb of god has not come down and gone which i deserved Why do the heathen rage? <laughs> he says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can you not see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Hmm. What's going on today? What's going on? Now listen, I understand. There are things in our lives that there get rid of them. That's hard. That's hard. And God knows it's hard. That's why he's going to help you if you turn to him and ask him for strength. By the way, there are some things that we need one another in order to overcome, we need the help of others. Sometimes those who are professional, we need their help to overcome. That is not a problem. That is not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of strength and a sign of wisdom. So go for it. Go for it. Maybe God's trying to get your attention about your status with Him. It kind of goes hand in hand with the last one. How am I? What's my walk with God like? Now please, here's, here's the deal. This is the measuring rod. Not how you feel today. Not what the latest craze and, 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 and spiritual guru has to say. This is the litmus test. How is my walk with Jesus today? That's a great question to ask ourselves every single day. Every single day. And to say, Lord, I want to be walking with you today. Please help me to do that. Please help me to walk with you. I like where Paul said in Acts chapter 24, I always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. That's, that's, that's great stuff. Let's follow Paul in that. And then maybe God's trying to get your attention about your relationship, your standing with others. Now, if you're not right with others, then you're probably not right with God. We tend to divorce the two, don't we? Oh, I got my walk with God going. I prayed today. I'm reading my Bible. I'm, I'm singing. I'm singing. I got Christian songs going in my head. But I haven't forgiven so and so. But I'm creating division. 
in my family, in my church. I'm setting myself up as a standard. That's pride. You see? And there are things in our relationship with those around us, whether they're saved or unsaved, in the home, at the office, in the school, in the church, that we definitely need to pay attention to. And we're, 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 uh, the Word of God says in Ephesians chapter 4, to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. So we're to do the same. So the first reason God may have derailed your plans is to turn your attention to Him. The second is to change your direction toward Him and for Him. Now I've got something that if you like to write notes, if you, if you want to jot something down, it's very important. And um, it's just four words, okay? This is very important to know. It's not about you. There is no more countercultural statement today, is there? It's not about you. It's all about God and His purposes and His plan and His glory. Now, joyfully, God wants to include us in all of that. You see, one of the great dangers today in the, in the, in the prosperity gospel and and so many other aspects of what people consider Bible-believing Christianity today is to think that God exists to make us happy. That it's all about me. Hey, you know what? The whole world is saying it's all about you, and the whole world is going down the toilet. Because when people have the idea that it's all about me, then it's not about you. And we go completely opposite to the Word of God. We start living, acting completely opposite to treat one another the way you want to be treated. Right? The golden rule. It's not about you. It's all about God. And it's all about God's plan for your life. Okay? Remember, His plan and His purposes are to reveal His glory. Now, here are some things to remember about His plan for your life. It's always bigger than yours. When you read Luke chapter 1, where the angel appears to Mary and tells her, this is God's plan for your life. Why? Because the whole world was going to be blessed. Not, because, not by her, but through the child she was going to bear. Right? It wasn't about Mary, it was about Jesus, and it was about the plan of God for the whole world. What did God say through Isaiah? And by the way, Isaiah 55, there are, you know, two verses that you know very well. The whole chapter is about the Messiah. The whole chapter is about the Savior. And God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. Higher than the heavens are above the earth that's how high my ways and my thoughts are above yours oh i don't understand god good <laughs> you shouldn't i was talking with a friend recently a pastor friend guy i've known since uh we met in bible college been friends for a long time and we were just kind of reveling in the work of God, God's mercy in our lives, and so on. And he said, you know, he said, you know, Kurt, he said, I think 
that one of the reasons we're going to be in heaven for eternity is because that's how long we're going to need to actually know the depths of God. I said, my thought exactly. My thought exactly. I think that what God reveals to us in His Word is a smidgen of who He really is and what He really is. And it's good to get excited about what we know. But eye has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Now I believe that's on the, on the eternity side, but I also believe it's true for here and now. That's how wonderful and marvelous God is. So, so God's plan is always bigger than yours, and God's plan is always better than yours. <laughs> Oh boy, you didn't know I was going to preach this morning, did you? <laughs> His plan is always better than yours. Now listen, we go through some difficult times and we say, God, can this, is this really your plan? This stinks. <laughs> and, and the event probably does. The event probably does. But hold on. Because God's not finished. I was listening to a song the other day. It, 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 I, f- I forgot exactly how it goes, but if it's not good, God's not finished with it yet. Because all things work together for good. All right? So hang on, but know that God is still working. His plan is always, His plan for your life is always bigger than yours, better than yours. By the way, Mary bringing this baby into the world I don't know if she fully understood everything that was going to happen but she was there at the cross watching her son die unjustly innocently cruelly as the chief of sinners and and the chief of thieves being on the middle cross watching him die But then she saw him resurrected. Then she saw him taken up into heaven. Her life was not an easy life. And that's the third thing you need to understand about God's plan for your life. It's bigger than yours, it's better than yours, and it's harder than you want. How many of you have the, remember the Staples easy button? easy button we want the easy button all the time right we want easy everybody wants easy easy doesn't build character easy doesn't grow your faith easy doesn't make you stronger in the lord easy doesn't give you the wisdom to help other people when they're going through the hard because you've already gone through it. You see that? And very honestly, ladies and gentlemen, it, was, it, it, it wasn't anything easy that Jesus had to do in order to die for the sins of the world, in order to take care of the sins of the world. Think about Mary and Joseph. They were unwed. Joseph thought she had been unfaithful. He got the news. She's with child. What? Well, that messes everything up. Now I've got to find a new, a new woman. But the angel appeared, took care of everything. Okay, very, all right. What about what people were thinking? Yeah, I, I know we don't do that right now. Hey, did you hear about Mary? <laughs> Wonder who the father is. You think it's I don't know. It might be little Tom down the street there. He, he visits the house an awful lot. I don't know. By the way, the religious leaders 
some 30 years later during Jesus' ministry accused him of being an illegitimate child. <laughs> oh, people don't talk, do they? Okay. How about the trip to have to go back to Bethlehem? Great with child. <laughs> By the way, I just want you to know people back then were a whole lot tougher than we are today. That's just, just going to, yeah. And then they get to Bethlehem, no place to stay, so I guess I'll have my baby in a cave with animals. I'm telling you. And then after that, they were warned that Herod was going to try to kill the the little boy, the, 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 you know, Jesus, and so they had to go to Egypt and live there for a while. No family support there. No friends there. Not that they had a lot anyway. You know what I'm saying? Tough, tough life. But they knew that it was the will of God. They knew that it was the plan of God. They knew it was the purpose of God to reveal the glory of God. And aren't you glad today that they were willing to say yes and not hit the easy button? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let me give you the third Thing that I believe God's trying to do when he derails your plan I said he's trying to turn your attention to him he's trying to change your direction toward him and for him by the way let me just one more thought there when your attention is directed toward God God does it remember it's not about you God does it for him remember that it's all for him and what we do for him in this life will be rewarded by him for all of eternity. And then finally, he's trying to increase your conviction in him, your faith, your trust. There have been times in my life when I thought, wow, I'm, I'm, I have reached this pinnacle of faith in my life there have been very few times by the way when I've actually felt like well I think I've got it all together and as soon as I thought I had it all together God said okay <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I will tell you this that every difficult time you go to and you turn your attention to God, and you give God the situation, and you say, God, I want you to get the glory out of all of this, your faith increases. Your faith increases. And we know from Hebrews 11, without faith it's impossible to please God. So you know what? God, increase my faith. Are we ready to pray that? Do we, do we really want that? I go back to the easy button. Some of you have been stomping that easy button. <laughs> one on each foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Remember, I've said this, and I will continue to, um, to beat this drum. Faith is trust. And we can say we have faith, but can we say we trust God? Do I trust God in these most difficult circumstances? Do I trust that God still has me in the grip of grace? Do I trust that all things do work together for good to those who love Him? Do I trust that even though this situation looks horrible, God is going to work it for His good, His glory, His plan, His purpose, His name. His name. 
so that one day, one day I can say, let me tell you what God has done. I got to, I got to preach a series of sermons back in the summer, right? If you haven't listened to those, by the way, they are on our YouTube channel. Let me tell you what God has done. Just a, just a smattering of the things that God has done for us, but in, in almost every situation, there has, it, it was like crunch time. Oh, uh, ee, hand wringing. Oh no, how's this going to work out? To where, you know, we're like, okay, God's got this. Because he did this, he did that, he did this, he did that. God's got this. Today, perhaps you're discouraged, stressed, and uncertain. And that happens, and uh, it just seems to happen a lot more during the Christmas season, the holiday season. I get that. You, you're, you're wanting to sing, you know, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Right? There is no joy on earth, I said, as you look around. In your life, you've got some serious things going on. I want to assure you of a few things. God still has a specific plan for your life. And He's working it. He's working it. And God is never going to leave you or give up on you. God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Not even the other guy. Okay? And the third thing I want to assure you of is that living out God's purpose is the only way to have peace, to have joy, and to have fulfillment in your life. I guarantee it. Christmas time is the perfect time to consider what God's doing in your life, what He wants to do in your life, and what you're letting Him do in your life. And for some of you, your back is against the wall. For some of you, you can't shake the guilt in your heart. That means God's trying to turn your attention to Him. And He wants you to receive Jesus as, his personal, as your personal Savior. For others of you, He's changed the plans that you've made for yourself, and you're fighting Him. That means He's trying to change your direction toward Him and for Him. And today, you would do well to say, I surrender, thy will be done. And still others, you're finding yourself in situations that you cannot resolve by yourself. God's trying to increase your conviction in Him so that you can trust Him more and live with greater faith. I wonder if anybody's here today, you would say, I know God's been speaking in my heart about receiving Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. and I've been putting it off, ignoring Him, but today I can't. I want Jesus in my life. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer silently where you're seated right now, directing it to God. God, thank you for your plan. Thank you for your purpose. Thank you for Jesus who came into this world to save me. Lord, right now I, I ask you, Lord Jesus, I want to trust you as my Savior. Not me, not my good works, not my religious background. Just you. And I ask you to save me from my sin. And I ask you to lead me as the Lord of my life from here on out. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Maybe your prayer today 
Christian is, Lord God, help me to see your hand in my life and what you're trying to do to keep my eyes fixed on you, to surrender to the plans you have for me. Lord, I want to walk with you by faith. And Lord, I seek your help to do so. I wonder if anybody would say that was my prayer for today. Just lift your hand up, put it back down. Amen, amen. Anyone else? Lord God, thank you. Thank you for the truths of your word. And at this Christmas season, even with the Christmas story, especially with the Christmas story, we are challenged to give our lives to you, to know that you are greater than everything we experience. You are greater than all of the bad and the sin in this world. And one day, Lord... Jesus will reign on this earth. He does reign in heaven forevermore, but one day he will reign everywhere. And Lord, help us as we celebrate Jesus, the reason for the season, uh, to keep that in mind. And as we watch the news and shake our heads, help us to recognize that your plan is still in force and nothing can ever shake it. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.